What is up, boxing fans, man? Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon and Boxing. Welcome to the new year, 2024. Same show, same host, baby. My name's Jeff, and this is episode 39. And today, we're going to break down this weekend's fight for you guys. Virgil Ortiz, back in the ring, goes up to 154 to try to stay healthy, guys. We saw this young man. He is a superstar, an absolute unbelievable guy to watch in the ring, man. I really believe his talent is... Unbelievable, but he just couldn't stay healthy at 147, and it's good to see him healthy back. Made weight yesterday for the first time in over 17 months, man. Been a year and five months out of the ring, guys. So it's good to see Virgil back. He'll have a tough little competition with uh, Lawson this weekend that will challenge him, but I don't think it will give me much trouble. We'll get into that and much more uh, in later into the show, man. But like I said, at the end of the year, we want to do some different things here on Bourbon and Boxing. We started a new segment called Bourbon Review of the Week, man, where I'm going to review one bourbon every week for you guys. Try something different. It's not going to be the same bourbon, uh, you know, that you guys are used to drinking. I'm going to try to venture out, find different bourbons, give you a little bit of background on them, uh, get in a little detail on those bourbons, and give you my true thoughts on how I think about them. And then you can take it from there. You want to buy it. You don't want to buy it. Uh, whatever you want to do. But look. Let's get into this show, baby. And there's only one way to start bourbon and boxing, right? Take a swig of bourbon, baby. We got some Woodford reserved today. Now, this is not the bourbon I will be reviewing. This is just the bourbon I'm drinking on today. Now, early last week, I decided to go after... What everybody's been telling me about, guys. The hype on this bourbon has been built up for me for quite a bit of while. So I decided to go out and give it a try. It's called Angel's Envy. Now, everybody told me, you got to go out. you got to try this bourbon. It's amazing. Uh, and I just tried Heaven's Door before that. Heaven's Door was a super impressive bourbon, man. Lived up to the hype. Everything about it was just amazing. One of my favorite all-time bourbons, Heaven's Door. So I would decide, okay, let's go get some Angel's Envy, give it a try, and see what the hype is on it, guys. So here we go, man. Our bourbon in review this week is Angel's Envy. Uh, it's a classification of a straight bourbon finished in port wine barrels. The company is Bacardi Limited. Distillery says undisclosed, but, guys, it's in downtown Louisville, Kentucky. It's not really fucking undisclosed. It's a big-ass goddamn sign on it. Uh, so it's not really an undisclosed location like they claim. You can find it easily. Uh, the mash bill on it is 72% corn, 18% rye, 10% malted uh, barley, and the price usually runs you about 50 55 We'll talk about that price later because I'm going to get into detail about this bourbon. First, we're going to go into adding on to this segment. Man, I want to get more into depth with these bourbons, kind of really tell you not just about the bourbon but the background of the bourbon, man, where it was originated from, when it got started, how long they've been around, uh, all that fun stuff. So, Angel's Envy, let's get into the background story for it. Angel's Envy was founded by Wes Henderson, son of late industry icon Lincoln Henderson. Um, made its first appearance in 2011, and we have seen uh, three ongoing uh, expressions. So far, cash strength, strength in bourbon finished in port barrels, and then bourbon finished in port barrels, and rye finished in rum cask. Uh, 2015, Bacardi uh, Limited acquired the company, and in 2016, the company opened their Louisville distilled location, which it says, you know, it's an undisclosed location, but then it tells you in the details where the fuck the location is at. It's, it literally says Louisville distilling location in downtown Louisville. So not much of a hidden thing. I don't know why they don't want to disclose when they tell you anyways where it's from. Stupid. But look, man, most of the batches are 8 to 12 barrels at a time. Uh, company states that the bourbon is typically aged six years, then finished in a ruby port wine cask for additional three to six months, guys. So that, it gives it a little extra time after that six-year mark, uh, a little bit more time in some port wine casks. Uh, okay, let's give you my thoughts on this. Now, like I said, I this bourbon was super hyped up for me. And everybody talked about it. Now, most of the bourbons that have been referred to me have lived up to what people have said they would. Uh, you know, everybody told me Uncle Nearest was really good, and it was amazing. Everybody told me Heaven's Door was really good, and it was amazing. Uh, 
Buffalo Trace lived up to the name. So when I hear, when people tell me about it, I look forward to trying it, and I don't want to be upset by it. So I'm hoping, you know, when I try these, they're as good as what they say. Uh, but let me give you my thoughts on it, on Angel's Envy's guy. Angel's Envy has a light oak, vanilla, and slight, uh, slight touch of berry jam, a touch of sweet syrup. It's not a flavorful bourbon. The 86.6 proof does it no favors. Light sense and uh, focus must be honed in to be able to sift through what is present. Lacks the impact I like in my bourbon. So it doesn't have that nice little punch to it uh, that I like for my bourbons, that little uh, that little strength, that a little bit more oaky taste for me, uh, a little bit more manly taste is what I like. Um, I'd have to say it's an average bourbon that presents itself as a premium product. That's just my opinion, guys. Uh, buzz lacks that kick. Not a great sip in bourbon. If you're looking for a good buzz, for me personally, was slightly disappointed in Angel's Envy, especially the hype surrounding it. I would give this bourbon an 85 at best. So, I mean, guys, I, I went in open-minded for this bourbon. Most of the time, the hype lives up, but I cannot say that I am a fan of Angel's Envy. Uh, like I said, it presents itself as a premium product, and it's not. It's not up there even with Woodford uh, Reserve, who I think is a premium-type product. Uh, the other ones that I named are premium products. Angel's Envy is not a premium product. The taste lacks, flavor lacks, doesn't have a strong aftertaste, uh, leaves you wanting more, doesn't have a great buzz to it. Uh, the, and like I said, the 86% proof doesn't do it any justice. It lacks that flavor. Uh, and it just, it's an overall, man, the price is way too high for this bourbon. Uh, like I said before, it, you know, it's not a premium bourbon. Uh, it, it's literally, it, you know, it presents itself at that. <clears throat> but I don't think the price definitely doesn't live up to what you hear about this bourbon. This bourbon should honestly be priced around 25 30 bucks at, at best. Uh, the, the, pr the proof is terrible. The percentage, the buzz isn't that great. The flavor lacks. Uh, just not my favorite bourbon, guys. Uh, Angel Envy, on, like I said, 85 at best, and that's me being generous with it because it was told to me and everybody's so high on it. So I'll give it an 85 at best. It really deserves an 80 in my opinion because it just lacks a lot. But I don't want to down on it too much. I did try it, disappointed in the price. The price needs to lower on it. I wouldn't buy it again, not for not for the price, not for fifty dollars. I would not buy this bourbon, not when I can get Heaven's Door for fifty-five, and it's ten times way better, a hundred times way better than Angel's Envy. So if I can get something like Heaven's Door, if I'm going to go up to that fifty-dollar price in my bourbon, then I'm going to go after something that has a good pr proof to it and percentage to it. It's got to at least be 150 if you're going to be charging $50 and above. I've been seeing so many bourbons on the shelf at 86%, under 90 proof, and pricing their bourbons at $50, 54 bucks. And, you know, I just, if you're not 100 proof, 50%, once it gets $50 or more, I want shit to do with you. And that, that, that's how I'm going to limit it from here on out. If you're not 100 proof at 50%, and you're selling your bourbon at $50 or higher, well, you can just kiss my ass, man, because it's not going to be worth it. I like a nice, strong, buzz bourbon. This bourbon, Woodford Reserve, literally 32 bucks, guys, $32 for this bourbon, and it absolutely puts Angel's Envy to shame. It's way better than Angel's Envy. The taste, everything about it, just so much better, and it's way cheaper. We're talking almost $20 difference in price between the two, and this one blows Angel's Envy out the water, guys. So, that is my review on the bourbon this week, man. That is my segment, Bourbon of the Week, man. Thank you guys for tuning in to that one. Okay, like I said, this week we only got one main card, but it is a good, young, up-and-coming superstar fighter that has held, had a few health issues the last year uh, or so, and... We watched him not be able to make weight. He's been in the hospital due to stomach issues, uh, stuff that could end your career as a boxer. And a lot of it had to do with the weight that he was trying to fight at at welterweight at 147. 
and his body just wasn't. I mean, Virgil obviously walks around about 170, so for him to put his body through what he was putting it through to try to make 147 just wasn't doing well for him and almost put him out of boxing completely. So it's great to see Virgil Ortiz back in the ring at 154, a weight that seems to sit on him very well. He made weight today for the first time in 17 months, so that was great to see uh, him on the scales looking healthy, looking nice. I think this uh, fight against, uh, who's he fighting? Uh, Frederick Lawson, if I'm correct. Lawson, good fighter, but nothing special. A great way to introduce Ortiz to the 154 to get his feet wet and kind of see where he's at right now since he's been out of the ring. But if you watch Virgil Ortiz, then you know that he's a very special fighter. I love the way this kid goes to the body and his combinations all the way around because he sets you up with going to your body to open up the head, which I just don't get why a lot of boxers don't take that route, you know, the body route, head route. The body's always going to open up the head for the big shots. That's what Virgil likes to do. He likes to get your body hurting, so you start going down to protect your body, and then he comes up with some nice uppercut combinations that he uses to take you out of the fight, man, and he is something special to watch before he got, uh, before before he went to the hospital and he had health issues, he was definitely an up-and-coming superstar in the sport, so I'd like to see what he can do, what, what he's able to do in this fight coming up. Now, guys, this is something, here, I'm sorry, I got a little distracted there, because I came across what I call gold, in my opinion. If you guys have Tubi, it's an app. It's free. doesn't cost you anything. Tubi, TV. It has a bunch of movies, all that kind of, and tons of free stuff. Like, unbelievable amounts of free stuff. But on their live channels, they have live television on there, too. They have a top-ranked classics, 24-hour, seven days a week, boxing channel, guys. When's the last time we saw that? When's the last time... We saw a station give you 24-hour boxing. Tubi TV is doing that. It's amazing. I've done watch Floyd Mayweather fight three times. I've watched Tim Bradley on his third fight right now. Uh, fighting the third fight, I've seen him fight already today. I have not turned it off of this top-ranked classic on Tubi TV. Super impressed with it. So tune into that, guys, if you're looking for 24-hour boxing. I love to have boxing in the background while I'm cleaning, doing things, cooking dinner, getting my kids ready, whatever, getting them. I have it on in the background just to hear, and this channel provides me with that without having to go to YouTube, find fights, keep restarting another fight. It just plays them on, man. 24 hours of nonstop fights, top-ranked classics, and it's just not top-ranked fights. Like I said, Floyd was on there. Uh, it shows pretty much all fights uh, that have already happened. It doesn't, you know, Showtime, HBO, old HBO fights, Showtime fights, uh, you know, all platforms. So it's pretty cool to see. Check it out on Tubi, guys. Uh, you can download that app on your TV for free. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything to use it either. That's one thing that I love about it. But back to what I was saying about the Ortiz versus Lawson fight, man. I don't think Frederick Lawson stands much of a chance, and I expect uh, – Virgil Ortiz to put on a show because he has to put his name. He was so close to getting getting himself a belt if he would have fought Sayonis, which I thought, hey, that's still a 50-50 fight. That would have been his toughest battle uh, against Sayonis, in my opinion, and he would have had an opportunity at a belt. Now he's got to put his name back in there. He's got to kind of restart everything, man. He's been out. He's got to prove himself at 154 the way he did at 147. I think he's going to be able to do that. I think he's a great addition to the 154 uh, weight class. I mean, come on, guys. You got Tim Dezu up there. You got Charlo up there. Adding a guy like him as Spence moves up and Crawford moves up, adding Ortiz to that mix is just only going to make it even better. 154 is looking at possibly a great weight division this year. Uh was really quiet last year outside of Tim Tzu and then Charlo moving up to fight Canelo. But outside of that, the division was rather quiet, guys. So let's hope we get more activity out of that division this year with Virgil being there. Virgil wants to fight three times this year, guys. He's not aiming towards a title, he says, at the moment. Uh, but I think if you see big things out of him his next two fights, he could possibly his third fight might be a title chance fight. Uh, so we'll see how that goes for him, man. There is a nice little undercard on that. Let's get into the undercard for it. Uh, you're going to have O'Hara Davis versus 
Ishmael Barosa. We all saw Barosa. His last fight was against uh, Roley Romero, who we all clearly saw that he was beating Romero. And then for some odd reason, Romero starts to go on this ninth round, uh, throwing what I called ghost punches, wasn't landing, and then the ref stops the fight and gives it to Romero, which was absolutely ridiculous and a robbery. on. But It was the biggest robbery of the year. Hands down, the biggest robbery of 2023 had to be that Romero versus Barossa fight. And here Romero is walking around with a belt like he's a champion. I don't like that kid one bit. I think out of all the, all the fighters out there that have a belt, He's the worst belt holder out there. Uh, and I don't really like to talk down about fighters, but I think Roley is just an overhyped fighter whose mouth keeps him in the industry. That's what keeps him entertaining is his mouth. But then when he gets in the ring, he's a fucking boring-ass fighter, and he doesn't live up to anything that he says. Uh, he doesn't fight any way that, that his mouth doesn't justify his fighting. He, it doesn't match up. He's got a bigger mouth than he does hands. Uh but on that, like I said, Barosa's on that undercard. He will get a chance. But O'Hara, O'Hara Davis, uh, he is a tough young fighter. So I don't know if Barosa gets this win, but this is a tough challenge challenge for Davies. Uh, I think that's going to be a tough fight for him. Uh, also on that, you're going to get Honor Bar- uh, Barbosa. I'm big on him at the uh, uh, 140. I think he's a good fight for anybody like Teo and them. The guy he's fighting, I'm not even going to pretend – to be able to announce this guy's fucking name. It starts with a X O L I S A N I. His last name is N D O N G E N I. How the fuck would I even start pronouncing that? Sorry, some of these guys, they should go by a fucking nickname or something. Sonny. That's what we'll call this guy, Sonny, because that name is just, I'm not even going to start butchering it, dude. It just will ruin my whole show, and I don't want to start recording, re recording this show right now, just over one name. So just know Ara Bar- uh, Barboza Jr. will be fighting on the card, uh, and I like him a lot at 140. I think he could be a great fight for Subaru Ma- Matea. I think that would be a great fight, honestly, uh, both being able to prove themselves against each other. And I know everybody wants Teo to fight Subaru, and everybody wants Haney to fight. I think Subaru Subaru Matea needs to prove himself a little bit more before he goes up against the big guys. Uh also, you got Raul Carrillo versus Elias Diaz on the. Uh, that'll be the first fight of the night. That'll be the opening fight, and then of course the uh, the uh, co-main, the co-event will be the O'Hara, O'Hara Davies versus Ishmael Barosa, Barosa, which we all saw. Like I said, Barosa, who claims to be 40 years old, but come on, dude, you're not 40 years old. You're more like 60. Uh, Really old, but that said, hey, he's in great shape for that age, for 50 years old, 60, whatever he is. He's not 40, bro, I can tell you that right now. Anybody who thinks that guy is 40 years old or believes he is, and why he would just say, I mean, just say your age, man. There's there's nothing in boxing that says, oh, you're 60, you can't fight. You know, you look 60, and they, they keep giving you fights. I'm pretty sure the only reason you got this fight was because they ripped you off in your last fight also. But hopefully... We see that same guy, so that would be a tough, very tough test for Davies uh, coming in as a younger fighter, trying to get his name out there and uh, prove himself at the 140 division also. Uh, let's go into the fight details of this. You're going to watch this on the zone. It's going to be tomorrow, January 6th. It's going to be located in the Virgin Hotels in Las Vegas. It's going to be about an 8 p.m. start time here in the U.S. Pacific, or, yeah, Pacific time. All right, where's my boxing news at, man? Uh, well, look at that. I have lost me my boxing news. All right, hold on, guys. We're going to pause this. All right, guys, I am back. Now, look, I was going to go into my boxing news, but before I do that, uh, let's give my sponsor a little bit of love, Brown Family Construction. For all your construction needs, try Brown Family Construction in the Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati area. You can reach out to Jason Brown on Facebook. You get all your information from him, and he'll take care of all your construction needs there. Brown Family Construction, where the name says it all, Brown Family Construction. Sorry, guys. <sighs> A little out of breath there. I had to run up steps, find this damn boxing newspaper. 
all that stuff. So let's take a drink of bourbon. Collect ourselves, man. Holy shit balls, Batman. How the hell did I lose this boxing newspaper? Like, what the Sam's hell? But anyways, man, before I do go on my boxing news also, I definitely got to give the women's boxing some love. I didn't do that on my award show. Uh, my female boxer of the year, I had planned out. I forgot all about it. My female fight of the year, I had planned out and didn't get to any of that. Of course, my female fighter of the year has to be Amanda Serrano. She fought three times. She was the first female to do 12 three-minute rounds, made history, unified a seventh division, guys, a seventh division she unified. So Amanda Serrano, hands down, female boxer of the year. No doubt about it. And like I said, her and Katie Taylor have to be the next fight in 2024. We have to see those two ladies fight for the second time. Uh, and then I'd love to see 12 three-minute rounds on that also for both of them. Katie said mixed feelings from Katie Taylor on it. Early in the year, in 2023, she said she didn't believe that female should fight 12 three-minute rounds. But then later in the years, after fighting Chantel Cameron, she said that, yeah, she would fight 12 three-minute rounds against Amanda Serrano. So I don't know. We'll see how that goes when it comes to negotiation. Things may change. But I feel like that's got to be the female fight of the year coming up in 2024, those two. But my female fighter of the year, definitely 100% Amanda Serrano, three times fighting, three times dominating. 12 three-minute rounds, making history, unifying her seventh division. There's no questions to ask about that, guys. But also, let's get to our female fight of the year. Obviously, Chantel uh, Cameron versus Katie Taylor, too. Katie got the win in that fight, and I thought it was kind of controversial. Could have went to Chantel if they would have given her that first-round knockdown. I think it might have went to her. But these two ladies, they fought it. They fought a hell of a fight. They beat the shit out of each other. And that was a female fight of the year, uh, Cameron versus Katie Taylor. And uh, we just found out today that Katie will uh, stay as a unified 140, but she's going to drop her WBO and IBF titles. Uh, I don't. I think in that division, or maybe the 135. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't think she should stay at 140. I think those girls are too big for her. She should stay at 135. That's her more natural weight. But that's just my opinion. Anyways, Amanda Serrano. Female Fighter of the Year, and Katie Taylor, and Chantel Cameron, the Female Fight of the Year. Felt shitty that I didn't give the females their love because I always preach about female boxing. I always support female boxing. I've got daughters. Uh, my youngest six-year-old loves to box. So we watched the female fights together, and I've seen such a, an improvement in women's boxing in the last five years especially. Uh, and what they've done in the sport, just unbelievable talents like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Alicia Boomgartner, uh, Sky Nichols, you know, girls like that, uh, Michaela Mayer. Uh, you got the big fight coming up next weekend, I think, or the week after that, Jones versus Mayer, which is going to be a hell of a fight. Those two ladies are great fighters. Um, uh, you know, Jessica Mescal, just some great talent in the female division. So I felt really crappy that I left them out of my award show. Uh, they definitely deserve to have been part of that, and I apologize to all the females out there who might have watched and wanted to hear that from me. And I apologize for leaving them out, man. But all right, man, let's get to our boxing news. There is a little bit of boxing news that, of course, we wanted to hear. Some fights that are being made uh, and are signed, done deals, and that we're going to get very, very soon. It looks like Teofima Lopez has signed on to fight Jermaine Ortiz. Uh, that's going to go down February 8th. With the co-main event of that being uh, Keyshawn Davis, he's going to be fighting Jose uh, Pedraza, and that's going to be Davis Keyshawn's toughest test by far. So I'm lo looking forward to that. It's been announced for February 8th, set for February 8th. I think that's going to be a hell of a card right there, especially for, uh, Jose Pedraza, who I favor against Keyshawn Johnson. I like Keyshawn a lot, but Jose is a hell of a fighter. Uh, Pedra Pedraza getting a good chance under his uh, belt there against a good young up-and-coming guy and Keyshawn's first test. So let's say maybe he proves me wrong, And but what I saw from him in his previous fights, I just feel like he's lacking a little bit of the power that's needed to be the guy in the sport. So especially at 135, man, it's so loaded in that division. So, so loaded, guys. Like, unbelievably loaded. Uh all right, let's get to some other boxing news. Big, big announcement 
pretty much set today is when I heard it. Anthony Josh, Joshua will take on Francis Ngane. Uh, this fight is set for March 9th. That's just rumors on the date. It's not a set date, but that's when they're saying they'd like to do it. It's around the same time that they were going to have the Wilder versus Joshua fight, which has now been pushed away. And I think that fight can still happen by summertime, but it's going to come down to uh, what happens through this first part of the year, pretty much. Because uh, it is being announced, or rumored also, that Wilder will be fighting Zhang on that same card as a co-main event. Now, if you get Wilder and Zhang, that's a good chance for Wilder to completely redeem himself and a good chance for Zhang to show that he's not a one, like, just beating a guy like, uh, God, who did he beat? Joyce, Joyce, just be the guy like Joe Joyce, who I've never been a big fan of Joyce, and uh, Zhang's only other top ten fight was against uh, Her Hergovic, who, you know, that was a tough fight, and I'd love to see those guys actually fight each other for a second time, Zhang and Hergovic, because that was a great fight. Uh, Hergovic came out with the win in that fight. So Zhang, 40 years old, only has two top ten fights on his resume. Uh, he lost one, and he won two two of those fights against Joyce, who both fights against Joyce, who I'm not big on. I just think he's overrated. But this is a chance for Wilder to redeem himself and Zhang to show that he is the real deal and he deserves a chance at Anthony Joshua. And I think that's what could happen if Wilder beats Zhang, which if he fights the way he did against Parker, that's not going to happen because Zhang is just as good, if not a better fighter, than Parker is uh, boxing-wise. So he's got a lot more to his arsenal. So I would actually favor Zhang in that fight. But let's say Wilder does happen to win. And I think Anthony Joshua is going to beat Ngane because now we got a little bit of tape on Ngane. And Anthony Joshua fought beautiful in his last fight. And if he continues to fight like that and he stays active, he's gonna. I think he's going to beat Ngane. And Ngane is going to get a, his first true uh, test at boxing. I don't know what the fuck happened to Fury. I, you know, I know there was no tape. And he says, hey, there wasn't any tape. It was hard to fight a guy with no tape, and I, I know that's true, that it's hard. If you don't know what a guy's going to bring to the table, it's hard to know what he what he brings. But I think as a boxer in Fury, he has to be disappointed with that, uh, you know, what he did in the ring that night. Just terrible. He wasn't that – he kind of looked like Wilder, just inactive, wasn't throwing punches, was waiting for uh, something that he could possibly counter to land a big punch. And, you know, that just makes for a boring fight in my opinion. But Ngane versus Anthony Joshua, I think, is an interesting fight. Joshua is a great boxer, and I think he's going to pose a lot of trouble for uh, Ngane, especially if Ngane isn't active and he's doing what he did against Fury because I think that's what lost him that fight against Fury wasn't that Fury beat him. It was that Ngane just wasn't active enough. He had two rounds where he, where he was active, seventh round, ninth round, whatever, uh, the knockdown in the second round. He was active in two or three rounds. But then he just kind of waited and had an, you know, they're saying you got to throw punches. Uh, it's boxing. It's not MMA. You got to throw some punches in there uh, to make, to make you know, to make yourself relevant, to to have a chance to win the fight. And I think if he had thrown his hands more against a guy like Fury, especially, you know, more of the rounds been more active, he could have won that fight just because Fury wasn't that active itself, but he was just active enough to beat Ngane, who wasn't as active so you know it costs him it costs himself that fight but we'll see what Ngane brings to the ring against Anthony Joshua who's been a more active fighter this will be his fourth fight basically within a year uh going into March he had fought four times within a year pretty much guys so pretty impressed with Joshua's activity staying in the ring keeping himself busy active I like that he has impressed me I was not a big Joshua fan just over a year ago but within 2023, he impressed me, guys. Uh, I like what I see from him. And at first I said I didn't think he could ever be a champion again. But I think Anthony Joshua can be a champion again if he gets his mentality right. The guy loves boxing. He loves the sport of boxing. So I think he can do anything he wants in the sport if he puts his mind to it and he's really sold on it. But Usyk is a tough fighter who I think beats Fury in both of those fights possibly. So you could get an Anthony Joshua versus Usyk 3. And it's hard to beat a guy who beats you twice. It's a mental thing, guys. Uh, in your mind, you just think you can't beat this guy. Uh, but like I said, that was announced today. Of course, Haney versus Garcia. That fight is supposedly in talks. It's been in talks uh, 
pretty much since the end of Haney's last fight, you know, Garcia saying, hey, I want that. Um, you know, Golden Boy wants to the course. Oscar, we're going to get this fight done. Don't believe a fucking word that cokehead motherfucker tells you. Trust me on that. Anything Oscar tells you is bullshit. But there have been a lot of talks with Haney being over with Matchroom. It would be an easy fight to make with Golden Boy. Uh, but I think it's not a good fight for Ryan Garcia to take at this point. I think Ryan should be taking the fight against Jose Ramirez, who just signed on with Golden Boy. I think matching those two up against each other would be a great, great fight. I think Jose uh, Ramirez would beat Ryan Garcia, but I think Devin Haney will destroy Ryan Garcia, will destroy not just beat him, beat him bad, make him look stupid, and end this young man's career. So I don't know if that's a fight, even though the money might be there, which I don't know if the money's going to be there, guys. How are you going to pay for this fight? Both are going to want a big payday. Haney's a champ. Garcia's, you know, the uh, social media champ. So, you know, they're both going to want big money for this fight. Let's see if they can fork that money up to get both of these guys paid to get it done. But I think it's a bad choice for Ryan. I think he should back up, do kind of do what Anthony Joshua was doing. Take that fight he took and then take another up-and-coming fight. Go against a guy like Jose Ramirez, which I think beats him uh, anyways. But I think going after Devin Haney is not a big smart career choice for Ryan Garcia at this point. And I know Oscar don't give a fuck because that contract's up, I think, March of this year. So Oscar don't give a shit. If Ryan loses or not, he's going to get one more big payday off of this kid. And if it's Devin Haney, that's what he's going to do. And then they'll drop Ryan. Ryan won't sign back with Golden Boy. But you can guarantee that Oscar's going to try to milk that cow as long as he can because that's what Oscar does, man. He's the new Don King, except for at least Don King put on big fights. Oscar just puts on shit fights half the time and then tries to convince you that they're the greatest fights you've ever seen in your life. Wow, we put on the best cards. Ooh, the best cards in the world. Let me do this one more line of coke, guys. Oscar. Fuck you, Oscar. Seriously. Sorry, guys, got a little colorful with the language there. Just when certain guys like, you know, promoters like Oscar just and Golden Boy, even Bernard Hopkins, both of these guys are just not good for the sport of boxing, man. Uh, I mean, they showcase that with how they treated Ryan Garcia within the last year. You don't do that with your own fighter. You don't badmouth your own fucking guy and then, you know, basically hope you can bring a guy in, Oscar Duarte, that can beat him and shit, and you're rooting for Oscar against your biggest pay cow in your whole fucking stable, and you're you're hoping that he loses again. Like it's just not smart business. Uh, but I think they know Ryan's not coming back, so why not get one more big payday? Put him up against Devin Haney, where he's gonna get absolutely demolished, in my opinion. I don't think he stands a chance against Devin. They did fight like six times in the amateurs. I don't know what the outcome was on that, but Devin is, I think now Devin is just completely. See, that's the difference in fighters, in my opinion. They both fought in the amateur six times, whatever. I think Ryan beat him a couple. He beat Ryan a couple, whatever. But the difference is is that Devin got better. Uh, he developed. He learned more. He, you know, he became a better fighter. Ryan is who the fuck Ryan is. Oh, I got a big right or left hand, and I'm just going to try to land that left. And that's all he's ever depended on. Uh, and I saw a decent little change in him against Derek James, but it took Derek to just kind of Put it in his fucking head. Do what the hell I tell you to do. Stop doing that stupid-ass shoulder roll you're trying to pull because you don't know how to adjust to a guy that's attacking you, which he should know at this point in his career. But I just think that guys develop different. Devin's develop into a way better fighter than what they were in their amateurs. Ryan's the same guy he was in the amateurs, in my opinion. There's not any difference in him uh, right now, so I'm not big on him fighting Devin. But if it happens, it's a fight I'm definitely watching. Uh, also, like I said, I mentioned Jose Ramirez. He signed on with Golden Boy, turned down $2 million to fight Teofimo Lopez, guys. Is that fear? Because is Golden Boy going to give you $2 million for any fight? Hell no, man. Oscar ain't going to fucking pay you. So for you to turn down a fight against Teofimo Lopez for $2 million, I don't know what your financial situation is, but that seems kind of silly. Uh, just to go sign on with uh, Golden Boy, who half the time doesn't pay their fighters or doesn't live up to their agreements. So, I mean, good luck with that. Uh, they, he doesn't have a great stable over there outside of Ryan Garcia at 140. So, I mean, you got Jack Catterall, 
uh, Montana Love, those guys, I guess he could fight him against and match him, a couple match room guys they could uh, match him up against. But Catterall didn't impress me with his last outcome, and Montana got Love got knocked slick out, so we may not see him back in the ring for a while, especially with match room who may end up dropping. He might have only had like a three-fight deal with them, so that might have been his last fight with him. Anyways, guys, that is it for the show, baby. That's all I got for you guys, man. Thank you for joining me for the first show in 2024, man, on Bourbon and Boxing. Once again, man, hit me up on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music. All you got to say is, Alexa, play Bourbon and Boxing. My shit will pop up on the newest episode, man. I try to keep it updated twice a week, Monday recaps, Friday breakdowns. Uh, also, catch me on my YouTube channel where I put my show up every Saturday now. I used to do Fridays. I do my recording on Friday, and I get it uploaded for you guys by noon on Saturday, especially if they, it, the only time I'll give it to you on Friday now is if there if there's early fights in the UK on Saturday, then I'll try to upload it for you on Friday. But outside of that, if the fights are over here in the States, I'll get it to you usually by the afternoon on Saturday. I'll pre-schedule it to be uploaded. But definitely tune in, guys. Check my group out on Facebook, Bourbon and Boxing, where I keep you up on all the latest news, schedules, all that cool stuff that comes with boxing, man. Like I said, Bourbon and Boxing, baby, where the drink is bourbon. And the talk is boxing, man. Thank you for joining me. Once again, I am your host, Jeff. This is episode 39. Thank you, guys.